Hi, this is Dr. Molly Gebrian, and you are watching the fifth and final part in the five-part series, What Musicians Can Learn About Practicing from Current Brain Research. If you've missed the first four parts, I've linked to them below in the comments, so you can go watch those. This uh, final installment is going to be about mental practicing. So let's get started. When I was 15, I got tendonitis really bad in, in both my wrists. And uh, for a whole summer and most of the next fall, I, I couldn't really play because I was recovering. And at that point in my life, many people, most mostly teachers, said to me, oh, you must mental practice a lot. And I said, oh, yes. But I was thinking like, no, why would I do that? What a waste of time. But then I discovered this study that I'm about to share with you, and it completely changed my mind about the efficiency and efficacy of mental practicing. So hopefully I'll convince you as well. So this was a study that was done on non-musicians. These people had never played any instrument ever in their lives. And the goal was to get them to be able to play this, you can read it, on the piano at quarter note equals 60. So they had five days, that, that was the duration of the experiment, in order to learn how to do this. So there were three groups in this experiment. The first group was the physical practice group. They had to practice this for two hours a day for five days. Can you imagine just that for two hours a day? Two hours a day for five days at the piano. Second group, mental practice group, is even worse. They had to practice it two hours a day for five days, mental practice only. So sit in a room, feel yourself play it, but don't move, don't make any sound, and don't fall asleep. So that's the mental practice group. And then the third group is the control group. So they didn't get to practice. The only time groups two and three got to actually play on a, a for real piano was for like two seconds at the end of the day when the experimenters tested how well they were doing. So what did they find? This graph here shows what they found for each of the groups. So the control group did not get to practice and did not get better. So if you want to get better, you have to practice. Thank you, science. All right, the physical practice group after five days was perfect. Good, they better be. They practiced that thing for 10 hours. The mental practice group after five days was where the physical practice group was after three days, which is pretty good. Remember, these people have never played any instrument ever, and they're just feeling themselves playing it in their heads without actually doing it. So at the end of the five days, the experimenter said to the mental practicers, okay, go into a practice room with an actual piano, go practice for two hours, and then come back and we'll test you again. And after they'd practiced on an actual piano for two hours, they were also perfect. But this isn't actually what convinced me that I should be doing mental practicing. What convinced me is the other part of this experiment that I haven't told you about yet. So around the same time this experiment, this mental practice experiment came out, a different experiment came out that showed that the part of the brain that controls the left hand fingers in string players is bigger than that same part of the brain in non-string players and then that same part of the brain that controls the, the right hand fingers in string players. So we now know that any part of the body that you use sort of specifically and intensively the way that string players use their fingers, that part of the brain will that controls it will get bigger. So for pianists that use both hands equally, both parts of the brain that control the fingers get bigger. You may have seen videos on YouTube of people that play piano with their toes. So for those people, the toe area gets bigger. Okay, so given that research, in this mental practice study that we're talking about, the experimenters hypothesized that at the end of the five days, the physical practice people would show a larger part of the brain for the part of the brain that controlled their fingers. So just like we see in string players, they expected that the part of the brain that controls the fingers in this mental practice experiment, that part of the brain would get bigger. So what did they find? They found that the control group who did not practice and did not get better did not show any change in their brain. No surprise there. The physical practice group showed a growth in this area of the brain exactly how they expected. So this graphic you're showing, looking at right now, it's a schematic, it's not actually brains, obviously. So you can see on day one, this area is very small. On day five, it's much bigger. So that's exactly what they thought. This part of the brain got bigger over the course of the experiment. What convinced me that mental practicing was worth doing was in the brains of the people that mental practiced only, they found that the part of the brain that controlled their fingers got bigger to almost the exact same extent as the physical practicers. Think about that for just a minute. These people changed the actual physical structure of their brain 
just by thinking about it. That's crazy. You can't do that in the world. I can't sit here and be like, you know, this wall behind me, the color's kind of boring. I wish it was purple and suddenly the wall changes color. I can't sit here and wish that the room I was sitting in was bigger and suddenly the walls push out, right? If I could do that to my physical environment, that would be a superpower. But you can change the actual physical structure of your own brain with your own brain. That's amazing. So how can you use this? Many, many ways. First off, any time that you can't actually practice, so you're in a train, plane, car, boat, whatever, and you can't practice, you can mental practice. If it's late at night or early in the morning and people are sleeping and you don't wanna bother them, you can mental practice. If you're injured, like I was, you can mental practice. I also use mental practicing a lot when I'm actually physically practicing. So if something isn't quite working, I'll stop, I'll, I'll mental practice it, I'll feel and hear myself do it in my head, and then I'll go do it on my instrument again. Just to clarify exactly what I mean by mental practice, mental practice means feeling and hearing everything that you have to be aware of when you actually play. So for me as a string player, I have to be aware of which finger or fingers are playing, what string am I on, what position am I in, am I doing vibrato, yes or no, um, what's the spacing between my fingers, do I have excess tension? Hopefully not in my arm. For the bow, what do my bow hand fingers feel like? Up bow, down bow, what part of the bow? What's the bowing? What string am I on? Um, what does the hair feel like on the string? Because that feels different depending on dynamic bow speed, all sorts of things. Um, what is the quality of sound I want? What's the tone color I want? What are the pitches? What am I doing in terms of phrasing and expression? Everything that you have to be aware of when you play, you want to be able to feel and hear those things inside your head. It's more powerful to do it if you don't move and you don't sing. So just sit there quietly. It feels very weird at first, I have to say. And you may find at first that you can't feel and hear anything in your head and that's fine, that's normal. My recommendation is to start with one aspect of playing. So maybe, you know, what do my fingers have to do to play these notes and leave everything else out of it. Once you can feel, okay, I play one, two, three here and that's the rhythm, then you can add in some other parameter until you can become aware of all the different parameters of playing. Mental practicing has been really revolutionary for me, both in terms of my own practicing, how I conceptualize what practicing is, and also in my own teaching. So I hope you'll try it out. It does take some practice at first to get used to what it is to mental practice, um, but it's worth it. So I hope you'll stick with it. This is the end of this video and also this series of videos. So I hope you enjoyed them. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions for me, feel free to send me an email. My email address is here. Um, if I don't respond to you right away, don't take it personally, uh, but I will get back to you eventually. Thank you for watching.